I thank you for coming tonight. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. You want to share some things that the Lord has laid upon our heart. Isaiah chapter 40, begin reading at verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over for my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint, and the weary, and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Yes. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our Father, as we come to you tonight, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Father, that we have the freedom in this great nation that you allowed to be formed and, and led to be formed. That we still have the freedom to come into this house and gather together in your name and to worship you and to praise you. I pray, oh God, for our nation and for its people and for its leaders that you would lead them and guide them Father, in the way that you would have them to go. And may they be obedient and follow you. I pray for this congregation tonight. As we look into the Word of God, I pray the Holy Spirit would have liberty to touch every heart in this place. Father, if there's a need here, I pray, God, that we would not leave this place with that need unmet. And I'll praise you and anoint, uh, glorify you for all that's accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated tonight. I come up with kind of a unique title for the message that I have for you tonight. Amen? Amen. I want to call this message Alligators in the Pond. Now I come up with that simply because I read a story recently about a lieutenant that was in charge of training GIs down in Florida during the Second World War. And he would bring these young men in, of course most of them, uh, back in that era probably came off of farms and they were used to hard work. But they had to be trained for combat because if you're trained for combat, they want you to go to combat, amen, and participate in the combat, but they also want you to come back. So they want you to survive. So the training, a lot of the training was aimed at survival. So these young men, they would bring them into boot camp and begin to train them, and one of the things that they did was run them through an obstacle course every day. Remember that, Bob? Been there. Amen. Done that, got the t-shirt, didn't like it. But anyway, as the training would progress, there was a part of it where they ran up to a pond, and the idea was to swing and run, run hard, jump out and grab a rope and swing over and drop down on the other side. But now they're in Florida and it's summertime and it's hot. So these guys get a great idea, see? Why don't we just turn loose a little early that water's good and cool. And we'll just drop into the water and just enjoy a cool, refreshing dip in the water halfway through this training period. So the lieutenant that was running this thing, he became a little frustrated. And then he got an idea. He went over to an alligator farm in Florida and he bought a 12-foot alligator and he brought that alligator back and put it in that pond. When the guys found out there was an alligator in the pond, honey, they didn't have no trouble getting across that pond. I mean, they would clear the ground 15 feet before they got to it, and they would clear the other side by 10 feet and roll around in that old hot dust, but they did not drop in that pond. You know why? There was an alligator in the pond. 
They knew that if they dropped into that pond, they were going to be alligator bait. Amen. That water was no more appetizing, no more appealing to them because they knew there was an alligator in the pond. Sometimes our behavior as Christians is sort of like the guys dropping in the pond. Amen. <laughs> We get these points that we want to rest. We want to just enjoy life. We, do, we want to just sit down. We want to just kind of take it easy for a while. And God has to put some alligators in the pond to get us going. You see, our behavior as Christians must be shaped by our God. How many of you know that? Amen. It's not what we want to do, but it's what God wants us to do. It's not what we purpose in our heart, but what God wants us to do. What God wants us to accomplish, the purpose God has for us. See, God can never use you. God can never use me unless we're willing to be trained. You see those GIs down there training in Florida? They would have gotten killed if they hadn't went through the training and learned self-defense and learned the art of survival. And I've got news for you, folks. It's the same thing as a child of God. How many of you know yes. that if we're not willing to listen to what God says, if we're not willing to do what God says, it's going to be like dropping into that pond full of alligators. Yes. You're going to be in trouble. Years ago, God, it's been <coughs> maybe 20, 25 years ago now, God gave me a message. And it was kind of a unique message at that time, or I thought it was, and it came out of one verse of Scripture in the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and the verse was verse 9. You can go there and read it if you want. I can tell you what it says. It says, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. And I began to study on that because that scripture jumped out to me and I found out that there's some unique things about horses in Pharaoh's chariots. I discovered and began to compare them with the Christian life. I mean, horses in Pharaoh's chariots, number one, were bought horses. Pharaoh went out and purchased his horses. Pharaoh paid the price to get the horses he wanted. How many of you know that God, when He saw you, He wanted you, and He paid the price to get you? Amen? Amen. God paid a price for you. He was willing to pay a high price for you. There was a price on those horses, but Pharaoh was willing to pay that price. He had the money. He had the price, and He was willing to pay it. God had the price for me and you, and our salvation, and our redemption, and He was willing to pay that price. Not only were they bought horses, but they were blood horses. I want to tell you something. Pharaoh didn't buy no junk. Yeah. Amen. Brother Bruce deals in horses. He gets a few hundred dollars <coughs> to a couple of thousand for a horse. But we're talking about horses with a lot more value than a couple of thousand dollars. Pharaoh was willing to pay high price. I mean, you go to try to buy a thoroughbred in Kentucky, amen, right now, and it's going to cost you more than two grand to get him. How many of you know that? Why? Because he's got a bloodline. He comes from a proven line, amen. The sons and daughters of blood horses are important horses. They're expensive horses because they have a proven bloodline. I'm here tonight to tell you I've got a proven bloodline. Amen? Amen? It's not by the power, not by my mind, but by my Lord Jesus Christ. And His bloodline was the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And that blood flows in my veins tonight because I accepted His salvation and His sacrifice for my sin. And I'm blood bought tonight in the Holy Amen. Amen. The third thing about Pharaoh's horses was well, that this is the important part. It didn't matter how much he paid for them. It didn't matter what the bloodline was. If they were unwilling to be trained, he couldn't use them. 
I said, Pharaoh didn't just go out and buy a horse and throw it in the chariot and send it out to the battlefield. You know why? Because the first time the battle started, it gone. So he needed some training. How many of you know tonight that when God bought you, you were a novice. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know what Christianity was all about. And you needed some training. Yeah. Amen. You needed to be taught a few things. I've watched over the years as, as young men especially come into the ministry. And, and, and God calls them into a, a particular part of the ministry, preaching or whatever. And women, well, they'll be in there about six or eight months. They think they got it all. They figured it all out. They know it all. And they're out on their own. And the first time there comes up a pond full of alligators, they're in trouble. Amen. You know why? Because they don't know how to jump over alligators. Pharaoh trained these horses. They were very meticulous in their training. They took time to train those horses in those chariots, amen? Because when they went out into battle, the driver of that chariot needed that horse to stand still and wait on the command of the driver and no other force right. at all. That horse would stand there with spears flying over its head and with men yelling <laughs> and with swords clanking and all of that, but that horse would not move until he felt a tug on the rein from the driver that was in that chariot because he was trained that way. Amen. How many of you know God trains His children? Amen. 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 How many of you know that God will not use you if you will not submit to His training? Amen. See, God has a purpose for each of us. But before we can accomplish our purpose, we must go through training as well. Go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I'm just going to give you some scripture tonight. Amen? And we're going to go through the Word of God for a little while. Shoot, I've got till midnight. Most of you don't have to be at work till... Come on now. Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to what the Word of God says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience. Did you know that patience takes training? Yes. You don't, you're not just, you don't just get up one morning with patience. Did you know you're not born with patience? If you think people are born with patience, you watch babies. You want to see an impatient group of people, babies are impatient. That's right. When they get hungry or get wet or get dirty or want something, they first start with a little whimper. If you don't respond to that, it won't take them long, honey. They'll be in full-fledged, screaming, raging. Mama, come to me. I want your attention. They have no patience. Anybody that's raised children knows that. Let us run with patience the race that is set forth. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How many of you know you've got to endure a few things as a, as a child of God? Yes. Amen. Nowhere in here did God ever promise us a bed of roses from the time we got saved to the time he took us home. That's right. If you find that, I'll change my preaching habits. Amen. But it ain't in there. But there are some things in there that will get your attention. Amen. There are some ponds full of alligators yeah. along the way. You understand what I'm saying? There are some pitfalls in this way. Amen. And if you're not trained, you will get in them. That's right. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be listen, weary and faint. We need some training. You know why? Because if we don't have some, the first time the devil jumps up in your face, you're going to get weary and faint. And down you'll go. 
Amen. I know some people have been in service for the Lord for 30 years, still ain't willing to take the training. Amen. And faint in your minds, you have not yet resisted of the blood, striving against sin. How many of you have fought the devil to the point where you bled? Anybody in here? Other than Gene? Amen. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody in here that has stood for the Lord to that extent. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, listen to this. It's very important what I'm about to say to you. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. How many of you know what rebuke means? It means correction. How many of you know that God, if he saved you, you're his child, he's going to correct you? That's right. Come on now. There's something wrong with this gospel that's coming around that you can do whatever you want. Everything's <laughs> going to be fine. We're all going to heaven. You serve any God you want to. We're all going to the same. That's not true doctrine, children. You can get into a pond full of alligators with that one. Amen? For whom the Lord listen to this. I didn't say this. God said this. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourges every son he receives. How many? Every. every son he receives. If you endure chastening or you endure rebuke or correction, if you endure this, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? How many of you know that God will correct you? I said, God will correct you. If you get out of the path that he wants you in, God will correct you. Don't ever get the idea he won't. But if you be without chastening, listen to this, it goes on to get worse. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, you read it. Then you are bastards and not sons. You see, the problem is that we've got a lot of people running around in the body of Christ trying to teach the Word of God that don't have sonship. Amen? I'm here to tell you that tonight. You need to beware of who you follow. You need to beware in this day of whom you listen to. Because the Bible said in this day, evil men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being Deceived. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Well, listen, we need to understand. Yes, God bought us. Yes, He paid a high price for us. But God cannot use us if we're not willing to be trained. That's right. If we're not willing to be taught by the Holy Ghost of God, then God cannot use us. Jesus said this in Matthew 11 and 29. You can read it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 said, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So how does God train us? He trains us through this right here. Somebody asked how does faith come this morning? It comes by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. You see all too often we try to exercise mama's faith or grandma's faith or grandpa's faith but I'm here to tell you it takes your faith and the only way your faith will grow is exercise how many of you know exercise is training yes. I said exercise is training and somewhere along in all of that training you've got to come up to a pond with a rope hanging over it and your job is to jump that pond full of alligators 
But if you don't know how to get across it, come on. Use your brain. You're going to end up being alligator bait. A pond full of alligators is nothing to deal with. I lived in Florida for a while. You go outside, you find an eight or ten foot alligator in your yard, you go back to the house <laughs> and lock the door and get on the phone and call 911 as soon as you look up the number. Because <laughs> you don't want to deal with no alligator. I'm telling you. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go back and look at it. Wherefore, listen to it again. Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every... How many of you know you can't train with a bunch of baggage on you? Can you imagine those guys training for the army trying to carry around a suitcase and stuff Mama sent for them home? Huh? I went in the United States Air Force in 1961. Never been out of the state of Tennessee. Never been out of the county I was born in. You hear me? They put me on an airplane in Atlanta like scared me dead. <laughs> Flew me to San Antonio, Texas. We got in there. It was late at night, Bob. You remember yours? This loudmouth sergeant met us. I learned to hate that man within five minutes. Right? <laughs> I met him. The first thing they did at about 11 o'clock at night was march us. They didn't say, why don't you just casually, you know, drift on up. They marched us. They finally got us in a, enough of a line to march them. They marched us over to this place. And here's all these guys by our encounters. And they lined us up. And the first one says, what, kind, what size hat do you wear? Well, I don't know. Put this one on. Come on now. The next one says, what size, what size pants do you wear? I wear a, a, a 32. Here, put these on. Boots, socks, shirts, and then they give you a duffel bag to store what you couldn't get on in. Now it's getting on toward midnight, right? And they take you over to what they call a barracks. And they say, find you a bed right now. You learn to move quick when your bed train doesn't move right. So everybody grabs the bottom ones, right? The fight starts. Some of us ended up on top. You know what the next thing they did to us? Let me tell you. Scott got up and he made a speech. He says, young men, I want to tell you something. Within the next six weeks, you are for going to forget everything your mama ever told you. We're going to make you forget it. Because we're going to let you do what we want you to do. And you know what? They were lying. That's true. He said, now the next thing I want you to do, he said, there's a stack of little boxes over here. And they give us all a box about that big and about that. I want you to pack up everything you own and everything you brought from home. Put it in that box and put your mama's address on it because she wants it back. <laughs> and they shipped out everything we owned except what they gave us over there about an hour before that. And it didn't matter whether it fit or it didn't fit. You put it on anyway because you're standing there butt naked if you didn't. <laughs> Come on now. And then they started training. And it was after one when we got into bed at 4.30 in the morning. This guy walks in and flips all the lights on in the barracks and says, All right, get up! And that's the way training starts, is it not? And it gets a lot worse from there. Huh? Get, I've experienced the pond full of alligators, amen? And the wall you climb over. And the logs you climb under. And, and you know what you, I found out? If you're climbing on your belly and there's live ammunition being fired over your head, you will not stick your head in. <laughs> it don't take long to figure that out. And six weeks later, they had us in some kind of semblance 
as a military unit. But it took training. Amen? They made us forget everything Mama ever said. I guarantee you they did. They let us lay aside every weight, everything that we had, and that they trained us the way they wanted us to train. God's the same way. By the way, He's not interested in what you learned out yonder in the world. God wants to teach you how to operate in His kingdom. Amen. 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 He says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, here's the problem. Too often we get weary in the middle of the train. How many of you know that? Believe me, we got weary down in San Antonio doing things like watering the lawn while it was coming a downpour because we did something we weren't supposed to do or didn't do something we were supposed to do. You know what else I learned down there? If somebody else does something, you get blamed for it. Everybody gets punished. That's the way the military is. But think about our text. Look at our text for a minute. Isaiah chapter 40. And look at what verse 30 says. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. How many of you know that training is tough? When you're going in God's army... You've got to go through some training. and It's not a walk in the park. Amen. God puts you through some things, allows you to go through things that will strengthen you and teach you how to defend yourself against the wiles of the enemy. Amen. Amen. I'm really concerned about Christians who've been in the faith 20 years don't know how to fight the devil. Don't even know the tactics of the devil. But I like verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How does that occur? That occurs through training. Amen? Yes. You don't get saved and develop that the next day. It takes a while. you got to jump over a few ponds full of alligators first. The Apostle Paul is the best example that I can find in the Word of God of what I'm talking about. Because all of us are familiar with the story. His name was Saul. He stood and held the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. He was well educated in the Jewish faith. Yet he was wrong in what he was doing. You and I know that. Because he was casting Christians in, in jail. He was trying to destroy the Christian faith, he was on his way to a town called Damascus and God confronted him. How many of you know God will confront you? Yes, yes. I said God will deal with you patiently over the years, but sooner or later, I'm telling you tonight, there comes a point in your life where God's going to confront you. And that's what happened to Paul. God let him go. He had the education, he had the knowledge. But on the road to Damascus, God struck him down, blind, and confronted him. And he'll confront you. Don't ever think God won't confront you. He's got a reason for you. He's got a purpose for you. He brought you into this world for a purpose. Did you know that? He will confront you. To make a long story short, Saul ended up down at Damascus. A believer went in and laid hands on him. Amen? He received salvation. He received the Holy Ghost of God. Did he not? Yes. It's all in the book of Acts. You can read it. But I want to show you something unique about Paul that you may never have seen before. Go with me to Galatians chapter 1.
Paul had to be trained. I said Paul had to jump over some ponds full of alligators. The first one was that he was rejected by a lot of people, even with his education and all that. Ultimately, he was let down over a wall by some Christians and escaped. But I want you to notice a couple of things in Galatians chapter 1 you may not have seen before. The Apostle Paul turned from who he was as Saul into an entirely different person. Galatians chapter 1. This is the new Paul, the Paul that has been converted, the Paul that has been trained. Listen to his, listen to what he says. Verse 6. I marvel that you are so re soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Listen to Paul. Which is not another. But there be some that troubled you and would prevent the gospel of Christ. Let's do his next statement. But though we, talking about himself, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have, we have preached unto you, let him be a church. Paul said, listen. He said, I've learned through my training that there are deceivers out there. There are people out there who will pervert the Word of God. And that's what he was talking to the Galatians about because they were listening and following other doctrines. Verse 9 says, As we said before, so say I now, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that what you have received, let him be a curse. <coughs> Paul said, be careful. I've been through enough training, he said, till I know that there are deceivers in the land. I'm here to tell you the same thing. There are deceivers in the land. We need to understand that a man of God must be trained. God will not anoint him. God will not use him until he goes through God's boot camp and he jumps over a few ponds full of alligators. So Paul said that if anybody preaches any other gospel to you than the one I preach to you, let him be accursed. Now move on over to verse 13. Let's look at what he says. For ye have heard of me, my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more, what? Zealous. Exceedingly zealous of the traditions. How many of you know traditions get you in trouble? People pick up too many traditions. Traditions of the fathers. Now here it is. Listen to it. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen, you listen to what's said here. It is very critical that you get a hold of this. This is the Apostle Paul, who was educated under Gamaliel. He was an educated Jew. He knew the law of the Jews. But you listen to what he's saying here. When God called him to reveal his son in him, verse 16, that I might preach him among the heathen, listen to what he said, immediately I conferred not with flesh. Now that's strange. You would have thought God would have sent him down to the first assembly of God, put him under a good pastor, and let that pastor take. Wouldn't you think that? <laughs> but that's not what Paul said happened. Paul said, that's not what happened. I didn't go down to the assemblies. I didn't go over to harvest time. Listen to what he did do. Verse 17. Neither went out to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. Well, you'd think if he didn't send him down to the first assembly, he'd at least send him down where Peter and 
John and all them guys were that, that had experienced the walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you think that? That's not what happened either. Neither went out to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Look at the next verse, 18. Then after three years, hey, we went through six, seven weeks of boot camp down in San Antonio. Paul went through three years of it. God sent Paul to the backside of the desert not to Peter and John, not to the first assembly, but the back side of the desert. And there, God himself put Paul through boot camp. Amen. Paul jumped a lot of alligators on the back side of that desert. You say, preacher, what did he do? You want me to tell you what he did? There's a little book right before Revelation. You need to go over there. I know somebody asked that question, and I appreciate you asking, and I'm going to answer. Amen. What did Paul do on the backside of that desert? There's a little book called Jude. Describes a lot of people. You ought to read it sometime. It talks about sensual people who separate themselves, having not the spirit, but they're in the... I knew a man one time, this is gospel truth. We were working on a construction site, and he we were sitting around eating lunch one day, and he told us he was going to go study to be a preacher because he didn't want to work hard all his life. <laughs> he told us that. I was right. And the last I heard, he was pastoring a Baptist church in Crossville, Tennessee. Go figure. <coughs> I've seen them mama, mama call daddy sin preacher of the Lord. But here, listen to verse 20. The book of Jude, verse 20. Here is a very serious responsibility for the Christian. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, building up your... Build, who? Yeah. Going to boot camp. Jumping alligator pits. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I can imagine a few people that dropped in the edge of that water made sure they got out pretty quick. Because <laughs> there's alligators in the water. Amen? Amen. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. How? Amen. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Listen. Verse 21. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What did Paul do on the backside of the Arabian desert for three years? Three years building up himself <laughs> on his most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul walked back into the circumstances. He wrote Romans. He wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. You want to know what he did? He built up himself. Amen. And he got in God's army and he went to work for God and allowed God to lead him. And that's what the rest of us need right there. We need to learn to jump some alligator lakes. Paul prayed the mysteries of God down into His Spirit and then He pinned them down and you and I know them as the New Testament today. During that time, Paul jumped a lot of alligators. There are a lot of ponds with alligators in them. How do you know? Let's go to Galatians 6. I mean, you guys like this? Yes. Yeah. Man, I like this. What's the lot? <laughs> Paul said something toward the end of his life that interested me. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul has now 
Damascus is way behind him. Three years in the Arabian desert is way behind him. The writing of Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, all those books of the Bible that we study out of and base our faith on today, he has already written. And he writes to in the book of Galatians chapter 6. Very wise man at this point. <coughs> Seen enough alligator ponds so he knows not to get into one. In verse 14 he says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said there's only one thing. There's only one thing that's important. I'm not going to glory in anything else that I've accomplished or anything else that I've done. All of the glory goes to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me. Paul said, I have no desire for worldly things anymore. How many of you know he said in one place, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He says here, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I don't need no houses, no big houses. Did you sing a song? I need no mansion here below, for Jesus said that I could go. Hallelujah. <laughs> Well, glory to God. After you've jumped enough pond full of alligators, you get this attitude, the world don't hold nothing for me anymore. Amen. It's all about my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. Listen to what he said. He said, By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, or uncircumcision, but a new creature. You see, that's what it takes, folks. You can profess anything you want, but what you need to become is a new creature in Christ Jesus. You need to open your heart and let God come in and make you a new creation. That's what He's all about, making new creations. How does He do that? Through training. Through the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God. That's how he's going to use you. Listen to what Paul said. <clears throat> Verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Lord, uh, on Israel of God. Paul said, I'm praying for those people who are sold out to God. I'm praying for those people who have been through boot camp. I'm praying for those people who have jumped a few lakes full of alligators. I'm praying for those people who not only started out strong, but they're getting ready to finish and they're going to finish strong. He said, that's who I'm praying for. You see, Paul learned something along the way. He didn't pray for every heathen in the country. He prayed for his brothers and sisters. Listen to this. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Listen to what he says next. Now this is the Paul that's far removed from the Damascus Road. He's been down the road, David. He's been there. He knows what it's all about. Ain't nobody can tell him. He knows. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He been in a few battles. Had some battle scars. <coughs> Had some wounds. One place he says, Demoth, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. In another place he said that another person that was traveling with him and working with him did he much wrong? How many of you know that still happens today? <coughs> Folk, listen. This thing is real. 
and we get weary in the battle. We get tired in the fight. But with the training God puts us through, we learn as children of God, if we don't learn, we need to learn to get off somewhere and separate ourselves and begin to have communion with our God. Because my Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. You want to know how to regain your spiritual strength? Don't do it trying to lead somebody to the Lord. Get off by yourself and begin to pray like Jude said in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And pray the mysteries and the strength and the power of God down into you and wait upon the Lord. And when you do that, you will renew your strength. Amen. You will mount up with wings as eagles. I fear... And I've seen it and I've been through it. That there are so many people now that are trying to serve God, especially pastors in pulpits, that are suffering from burnout because they don't know that they need to get off by themselves somewhere and build up their self on their most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. They just give and give and give and give till there's no more to give. And people still demand and there's no more to give and they need to learn. If they jumped over enough ponds full of alligators, they would know. When you become depleted, get somewhere. Get away someplace. Amen? It doesn't take long sometimes. Well, just a little while. You know how I know? Friday, Judy and I just throwed some months in the toss and went to trade with was it Friday? Thursday? I don't know. One of those days. I forgot about harvest time. I didn't think about you. I didn't think about Bob. I didn't think about you. I didn't think about nobody. I went to Trail Ridge and took my grandson. Drove all the way up there. It's cold up there. 64 degrees. Wow. You know why? Because there comes a time when you've got to renew and refresh yourself. Sometimes it takes longer than that. That one day trip did it for this time right now. Because we come back refreshed. Sarah, ready to go again. Ready to jump some more pump and pull out of here. But I want you to know your whole Christian life. Around every turn, you're going to find a pump full out of here. You better learn to jump them quick because they're out there. Amen? You certainly don't want to fall into the pond. Because alligators are dangerous. They are mean. They are ferocious. And they will hurt you. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6. And I'm going to close with this. And verse 9 says. Let us not be weary in well doing. For we shall reap. If we faint not. I encourage you church. You hear me tonight. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for this church. And that purpose is not going to fail. We need to yield to God.